Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, for a discussion on the border revision, the fun and exciting world of challenging your property values here in Ashtabula County. Uh, I'm your county auditor, David Thomas, and I'm joined uh, this evening, uh, our border revision clerk, uh, Tara Frabel, who's uh, joining us virtually from her home. And so we're just gonna go through the border revision process real quick, the actual forms to fill out, uh, answer any of your questions as you have them, feel free to go ahead and chat and type those in to your type feature. We'll answer some of the frequently asked questions that we often get with border revision and uh, uh, have this available for folks to watch at a later date or to review um, who may have missed uh, this evening. And as I shared uh, in an email update this afternoon, uh, if you are filing a border revision uh, this year, you don't have to watch uh, our webinar. Um, there's no requirement for you to do uh, anything whatsoever. Uh, this is just a, a great way that we thought would uh, help to inform and to answer some of the questions ahead of time and to uh, give you as much information as possible. So right here is our homepage of our website. And I only uh, have it here real quick just to show you a wonderful feature, a, a page that I uh, highly recommend you um, visit. This is the questions on your property, tax charge or property value. And here we go through, we have a lot of explanations, a lot of detail and information uh, for your tax rates, for your value changes, the evaluation process, good information to know. We've got how to look up your actual property and a tax distribution, for example. So this is really a go-to uh, page on our website and it lives right on the home page. You can visit it either in our rotator here or um, right down here uh, below with more news. And so without further ado, Tara, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, go to our border revision page on our website. All right. So at the top of this page, um, you will see we have all the different forms. So so the first form is the DTE form one. That's the most, that's going to be most commonly used. Um, that would be for, you know, any residential commercial type property complaints. Um, they, we also had on there, there was the DTE um, one for mobile homes. So if you have a manufactured home, those trailer parcels have the, uh, their own form. And then the DTE form two would be anything else. So that would be um, if you were removed from our CAV farming program, if you wanted to contest the classification of your property, those would all use the DTE form two. Um, and then we also have on there our rules of practice and procedure that kind of outlines the process. So we'll go back to the actual form. And this sometimes can be a confusing form for folks to fill out, we wanna make sure that you do this correctly because this is a, a legal process. Um, and so uh, how you complete forms and documents is a, a big piece of uh, completing the board revision correctly, which is definitely our goal. So Tara, why don't you go ahead and kind of walk us through real quick what each line means and what maybe some of the common um, mistakes that folks make uh, on the form. Yeah, so the first one, you know, line one, owner of property, um, that's just going to be how the property is deeded. So if you know it's Joe Smith, you know, put that on there. Now, the only thing is if you have a property deeded in like an LLC or some type of company name, that is the name that needs to be on owner of property. So it's really important line one is how the property is deeded. So what you would do, you'd put that on line one and then right next to it, street address, that's where you'll put your mailing address. That's important. Um, I know it doesn't say mailing address on the form, but that's what they're asking for there. Anything, whatever is put on that line as your address, that's where we'll mail all of your notifications. So it's important you put your mailing address on that line there. Um, so line two, complainant if not owner, you would use that in the case of, like I said, if it was a company name. So line one, owner of property would be the LLC name. And then line two would be your name as the filer, um, or, you know, say managing member of the LLC. So you would be line two complainant. Line three, that would be complainant's agent. That is if you were using an attorney um, to represent you. That is not at all a requirement for this process, um, but oftentimes for big commercial properties, um, a lot of people do like to use attorneys to represent them in those cases. Um, so that would be what would go on line three. 
And then line four is pretty self-explanatory. Your phone number, um, line five is your email address. And I will know um, if I have, if you do put an email on there, you're going to get notifications via email and standard mail. Um, so that does help us say, you know, you don't have to to send certified mail um, if I have your email address. So that's kind of nice because certified can sometimes be a hassle. You have to you know, go to the post office and sign to pick it up. So if I have an email address there, um, that kind of streamlines that process. And then line six, complainant's relationship to property if not owner. That's where you would just explain if you wrote on line two, um, you would put, you know, you're the managing member of the LLC um, or a spouse can file on behalf of a spouse. So you would, you know, you would write whatever your relationship to the property is on line six. And Tara, <laughs> one of the common um, perhaps mistakes or issues, uh, for example, if a, um, a parent and a child, the child would file on behalf of the parent or the child would show up uh, on behalf of the parent and that's not an acceptable uh, use. Right. Yeah. So it's very specific who is eligible to file and who is not. Um, so I mentioned the spouse filing for a spouse. But yes, as David said, a parent cannot file for um, a child. A child cannot file for a parent. Um, power of attorney is not, you know, an eligible person that can file. So there are specific people that are eligible to file. Um, so that's one thing we look for to make sure, you know, you have the right to contest this value. Um, so next thing, uh, line seven, your parcel number, which is right on your tax bill. Um, you'll notice there are enough lines to put three parcels on the form. So if you want to contest more than one, you have enough room. You do want to make sure that the parcels are located in the same taxing district. So if you have, you know, two parcels in Kanya and one in Ashtabula, you would want to file separate complaints for those. But any that are in the same taxing district, you can list on the same form. So you'll just write um, up to three parcels. If you have more than three, you can either submit another form or you can even attach a sheet of paper and write out you know, those parcel numbers. And then next to that is just the address of the property if those are different than your mailing address. Line eight, principal use of property. So that's gonna be your residence, whether it's farming, you know, hunting, whether it's a business, a rental, whatever you use the property for, that's what you'll put in line eight. And then line nine, this is where, you know, most people get tripped up. So this is a very and very important part of the form. You know, again, you see the very far left column, it's your parcel number. So you'll rewrite the parcel number from above. And then column A, complainant's opinion of value. That is where you'll put the value you feel as a property owner. What is your property worth? Um, so, you know, a lot of times people leave this blank. They may put the auditor's value. They may even put a tax figure there. It's very important you put the value you think it's worth. So say you were, you know, wanting to sell your property. What do you think you could get for it on the open market? And the key for Keep that too mind. is the date. Um, you know, yeah, I was just gonna say that. <laughs> yep, yep. Go ahead. Yeah, so this date um, value is as of January 1st of 2020. That is the lien date for the taxes you're currently paying on. So, you know, say you've had a fire or something happen through the year, maybe December 2020. Unfortunately, that's not real relevant to January 1st of 2020. So think about the property, its condition and its state as of January 1st. Um, so that is what you'll put in column A. If you have multiple parcels, you can you know, list each parcel in a separate value for each of those parcels. Say you have a home but you know you you have a home with a vacant land parcel right next to it, so you're really filing on two parcels. If it is like an aggregate value, you can put one value with both parcels listed, or you know you maybe purchase two parcels for one hundred fifty thousand. You can list each parcel, but just put one value for you know th them as a whole. But I would advise you know if you're if they're separate parcels, maybe you own one home and then a rental down the road, I would list a separate value per parcel in that case. And then column B, that is the current auditor value. So that's the value you are contesting. And then column C would be just the change between what you're requesting and what you're currently being taxed at. 
And this is our current market value. So on our website, on your tax bill, it's the appraised value. There's the question of you know, market appraised value, then tax value, which is 35% of the appraised value, the market value. But this is the full appraised um, value of what we believe your property would sell for on January 1st. Okay, so next thing, line 10, requested change is justified for the following reasons. That's where, you know, it gives you some room to explain why are you seeking this change? Was it a recent purchase? You know, did you, are there condition issues with the property we're not aware of? Any reason why you're requesting the change, you want to, you have room there on line 10. Now, I realize they don't give you a ton of room. So if you need more, you know, room, attach as many documents or pieces of paper that you need, because the more information we have up front, the better. Um, so go ahead and, you know, fill out anything you can think of, you know, why are you contesting your value? You want to list that all out on line 10. And what are some of the justifiable reasons for, you know, for contesting a value? Yeah, so really the, the number one for us would be a recent sale. So if you've had a recent, what we would call an arm's length transaction, meaning willing buyer, willing seller, exposure to the market, uh, unrelated parties, that would be what we consider arm's length sale. That's always best evidence. Um, so absent a recent sale, if you have an appraisal report, you know, if you've recently gotten appraisal done. Now keep in mind, you know, that January 1st, 2020 lien date. Um, appraisers are able to do retro reports back to that lien date. Um, so if you do choose to get an appraisal, they can do that for you. Um, now, if you already have an appraisal for maybe a bank, you know, if you got a bank appraisal, you can submit that. Um, it just it's just done for different purposes, so keep that in mind. Um, and then outside of it, a, a sale or an appraisal, um, you know, if like I said, if you've had damage done to the property or there's condition things on the inside that we can't see from the outside, you know, we need to be aware of that as well. Um, so question 10, was the property sold within the last three years? So, and that would include your sale. Sometimes people do get confused on that. Um, so if you've recently purchased the property in the last three years, then you would check that box yes and give us the date and price of that um, purchase. And, you know, if you haven't purchased it in the last three years, then you would check no. Uh, question 12. If a property was not sold but listed for sale in the last three years, attach a copy of the listing agreement. So that's always helpful for us. Like if you've had it listed, you know, through the MLS, um, you can provide a copy of that agreement for us. Uh, question 13, if any improvement was completed in the last three years, show the date and total cost. Um, so that's something, you know, again, if you don't remember exactly the date, you know, give us a rough estimate of the month and year and what your approximate cost was. Uh, question 14, do you intend to present the testimony or report of a professional appraiser? So if you know you're submitting an appraisal, if you have one already, check yes. Um, if you know you're not, check no. Um, typically, if you check unknown, that means we're kind of assuming you're going to submit an appraisal at some point. Um, but you know, it is important if you do present an appraisal and if you're, you end up having to come for a hearing, make sure your appraisal will be able to attend that hearing. Um, it is important because you didn't create that report, um, so you can't testify as to how you came up with those numbers. So it is important to have that actual appraiser at the hearing. So if you are going to present, you know, the testimony, keep that in mind. Um, oftentimes, if it's a good appraisal, you know, a hearing may be, not be necessary, but, you know, if we need to have a hearing, make sure that appraiser is there. And an appraisal isn't necessary uh, to have a successful board of revision, but as Tara said, it certainly is the most helpful thing for us to be able to see uh, at a very detailed level your property comparisons to other properties with mass revaluations, mass appraisals. We do a, a very um, average, higher level uh, type of look at, at properties, all 80,000 or so parcels that we have here in the county. But a, a specific appraisal for your property really dives into uh, where your property is at as of that January 1st, 2020 date. 
So the last thing, question 15, it's asking if you filed a complaint in the um, last reappraisal or update of property, these are the certain exemptions that you can refile. Um, so for this tax year, for tax year 2020, our current tax year, question 15 is irrelevant. If you had filed, you know, last year, any prior year, you can still file this year. Um, and that is because this, our reevaluation restarts the three year filing period that you can file. Um, so you don't have to worry about question 15 this year, but do keep in mind, if you filed this year, um, you may not be eligible for another three years to file again um, until our triennial update. So it's kind of on that three year cycle, unless you know you fall under one of those exemptions there on the form. And then the last thing is date and sign. Um, we are due to COVID waiving the notary currently. So don't worry about getting the notary, um, but you know, typically that is part of the form, but don't worry about this year, but your signature is very important. If the form is not signed, you know, we can't hear the complaint or do anything with it. So that's one of the critical parts of the form. So make sure you do sign the bottom. Just a reminder, if you have questions, feel free to chat those in. <clears throat> we'll go back to our website now, but we'll be happy to answer any questions on the form itself or any of the things we've already discussed. The back of the DTE form, there's a lot of helpful information as well. Um, and Tara, can you give, can I give a, a quick snapshot while I go back to the website about the deadline to apply to file the form and what happens if it comes in after the deadline? Yeah, so the filing deadline is March 31st, so that is coming up. Um, that is a hard deadline, so if someone comes in on April 1st, we cannot accept your form for this tax year. So the dead, deadline's March 31st. We do accept your postmark date if you mail it, so as long as you get it in the mail by the 31st, you will be okay. But yeah, that's something we really can't budge on. If it comes in, you know, after that date, we will be un unable to do anything for this tax year. I just had a question from someone uh, on Facebook Live. We also had this streaming on Facebook Live. So she submitted the form at the end of January. When will she hear something back? Sure. So I get that, you know, question a lot and understandably so. Um, it's real hard to give a timeline on these things. You know, they're coming in every day. We already have, you know, nearly 200. So our staff is reviewing them as we speak. You know, they're, they're actively reviewing these. We've even, you know, been able to vote on some of them but when you even if you file in January sometimes it may take until June you know in the summer to hear from us so we're trying to get through them as quickly as possible just keep in mind it can be a lengthy process um, you may not hear from us for a few months so I wish I could give a better timeline on that unfortunately it's just hard to tell we try and do first come first serve uh, but it will vary depending on the, the type of properties and what we're looking at and what the specific appeal is so we're back on to our border revision website uh, here on the auditor's website, the uh, border revision page. And Tara, if you want to talk real quick about uh, any of the sections of, of this um, of this page uh, that we haven't hit on yet, for example, um, you know the value aspect versus taxes and and what the actual proceeding is like. Sure. So, yeah, is it. As it states there on that first sentence, you can contest your property value, um, but we do not deal with the tax dollars. So the Board of Revision has no authority to adjust your tax dollars. The only thing the board can look at is your property value. That's the only um, jurisdiction they have. So, you know, we understand, obviously, a raise in taxes is what's going to get your attention, you know, and make you look at your tax bill. But we can't just adjust the tax dollars. We can only adjust the value. Um, so that's very important. Um, let's see. And then as far as the legal... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just about to say, and with that, though, for example, let's say that we did uh, agree with a complainant and their value was decreased, um, their taxes would actually be changed, but we're not hearing the complaint on the taxes. It's the value applied to the tax rate. So they could actually get a check or a, a credit, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, and I think that's part of the frequently asked questions, mm -hmm. but yes, we will, um, you know, if there is a value adjustment that will adjust your taxes, and you'll either see that on your second half tax bill, if you get your adjustment prior to that um, billing in July, or you will actually get a refund if it's in excess of what's owed. 
Yeah, so go ahead and touch on the, um, the actual proceeding and the um, pro proving your case right here. Yeah, so, you know, the, it, the burden of proof falls on the complaint, and I don't really like to say it like that, but that is, you know, basically what it comes down to. The auditor, you know, we've established our value. Um, we have the research, you know, to back that. So now the kind of falls on you as the taxpayer to prove why is that value not accurate. Um, so when you come, you know, to the hearing, um, we look at all evidence you've submitted. So we take, you know, put a lot of time into reviewing all of your, your um, documents that you submit, whether it's an appraisal, you know, whether you have the listing that it's been listed for sale and you haven't been able to, you know, sell it. We review all of that information and weigh it. Some information, you know, means a lot more than others. We understand sometimes your neighborhood might be not real good, but just sending in a picture of maybe your neighbor's house doesn't do us as good as an actual appraisal report. So we have to weigh the, the evidence um, to see if it supports what you're requesting. So there's some, you know, like a list if it's recently sold, we like the documentation for um, your purchase. If you have an appraisal report, um, cost estimates to repair deficiencies in the property. Um, for commercial properties, if you have the income, you know, and expense statements from, you know, that tax, you know, your 2020 year, um, that is all very helpful for us. And we review all that prior and we, you know, the board has questions at the hearing about that information. Um, so when you come to a hearing, you're going to, basically just tell the board, um, the board's just going to ask you questions. Why do you think your property should be valued at whatever your request is? So it's not really an, uh, an opportunity for you to come in and ask questions. You really more, you know, get to answer questions about your property. Um, and then, you know, the board takes all that in con into consideration. And you usually find out within four to six weeks, the results of that hearing. And the actual process itself, you know, Tara, um, we don't actually have to have a hearing on every single border revision complaint that's filed, right? Right. So that's part of that back end where our staff does a lot of review ahead of time. Um, really, probably 60% of cases are resolved without even going to a hearing. We try to expedite, you know, and bring in the least amount of people as necessary. So oftentimes we can, um, you know, send out what we call offer letters, um, you know, kind of negotiate and come to a to a mutual um, agreement prior to a hearing being necessary. Or if you, you've really proven your case ahead of time, submitted enough evidence, we can go ahead and even agree to your complaint without you ever having to come in. Um, so basically after you submit your complaint, the only thing you have to do is get your decision letter at that point and your tax adjustment. So that's kind of the ideal you know, outcome from all of this. But yeah, we try to resolve as many as we can without having a hearing. And to Tara's point, yeah, about 60% or so are actually resolved without a hearing, and roughly 80% of the BOR cases are actually um, some type of, of adjustment in the taxpayer's favor. So the more information that uh, you as taxpayers, as residents, give us, the better for us to be able to make a decision. And the actual hearing itself, uh, it is, you know, as Tara said, a formal legal proceeding, but we try and make it as, as casual and as uh, non-stressful as possible. Um, so you're there with myself, the county auditor, uh, the county treasurer, or her appointee, and the county commissioner, or their appointee. And so we'll ask you questions. We'll kind of walk through what your application form was, um, try and find out more about your property. You know, a perfect example would be a, a property where, um, based on a re, uh, you know, maybe a sale five years ago, uh, the property we believe should be roughly around that sale price. But what we don't know on the inside is that you know, you've completely gutted the property to re rehab it. And so, you know, as of January 1st, 2020, the property didn't have plumbing or didn't have electricity. And that may not be something that we know, but something that through the border revision process, you can share with us uh, or foundational issues, leaks, other damage, uh, or information that um, just, you know, we may not be able to, uh, to get through the mass appraisal process. So we'll scroll down here to the notifications in the appeal process. Yeah, so um, we are required to send out any hearing notices at least 10 days prior to your hearing 
date. Um, I always try to get them out, you know, sooner than 10 days. I try to give 14 or more days. Um, so you have time to prepare. And if you can't make a hearing date, you know, we're fairly flexible with trying to reschedule. Um, but yeah, as it says, they're required, you know, by certified mail. Again, as I had stated earlier, if I have an email, I can skip that certified mail part and send it standard mail um, and through your email. But if you know you're unable to attend, please let us know as soon as possible so we can try to reschedule a new date for you. Um, and, you know, we're also going to be doing virtual hearings. So if it's something where you're really not comfortable or, you know, don't want to come into the building for your hearing in person, you know, please reach out and we can try to get you scheduled for, you know, a Zoom or, or a phone or, you know, some type of virtual hearing for you. Um, we were able to do some of those last year and they work pretty well. And we had a question. Uh, will we receive a determination either way on our Board of Appeal submission? Yes, so every single filing, the board must vote and make a decision and every single filing, you know, receives a decision letter, you know, whether it's in your favor or not, um, everyone will receive that decision. And again, that will either come certified mail or email and standard mail. And that will outline exactly, you know, what the board voted. And so let's say that you, uh, you know, a resident may disagree with, um, with uh, the board's determination, either uh, the board keeping the value as is or the board lowering the value, but not to where the resident believes it should be. What's, what are the different uh, avenues that they have? Yes, you have the ability, if you disagree with the board's decision, you have 30 days to appeal that decision to a higher court. So you can either file to the Board of Tax Appeals in Columbus or the Court of Common Pleas here in Jefferson. Um, so it's very important that you notify both the county board of revision that you're appealing and the higher court, either the tax appeals or Court of Common Pleas. That's very important. If you only notify, you know, the Board of Tax Appeals and don't notify us at the, you know, county level, then, you know, that won't be able to be heard. That will be considered jurisdictionally flawed. So it's very critical that you notify both the Board of Revision and the court. Um, and that 30-day deadline, again, that goes by your postmark, and that goes after the day um, that you, uh, that I mail your decision. So that's when that 30-day clock starts. So you do have those <laughs> avenues yep. for um, for appealing uh, now I believe you know, less than one percent of our cases are appealed um, we do our best to try and meet you know folks in the middle or or do what we can um, to agree to values but those are the two different avenues uh, and you know once again as Tara said you you do not need a lawyer uh, you do not need an appraiser by any means um, for the board of revision process uh, certainly if you were to go to the court of common pleas route um, you know that's a that's a, a legal proceeding uh, the BTA is a little bit more of an informal proceeding, but still uh, is more of a legal proceeding than the, the border revision round. Uh, we do have a question. Um, how do we proceed if the parcel is vacant land, if they disagree with the value of a vacant land uh, parcel? Okay. Yes. So, I mean, as far as, you know, filling out the application, submitting it, that doesn't, you know, it's still just putting, identifying that parcel ID number um, and establishing the value. Now, when it comes to land, you know, we look at what is property, what is land and your, you know, type, your acreage selling for in your district. So if you have a five acre parcel, we're not comparing it to a hundred acre parcel. You know, it does go by acre increments. So you'll want to look at, you probably want to do a little research, you know, on the land sales in your area, because that's what we're using to develop our values. Now, maybe you have wetlands or, you know, the property is unusable. There may be some reasons why our value couldn't, you know, be inaccurate for your land. But for land, it's very strongly based off of what is property selling for in your area with similar acreage. Yeah, perfect example of that, Tara, would be actually, I have a my own personal home acre site, and then I, um, I recently bought an acre uh, just north of me, and based on average um, average sales, average value here in, in my district, that acre should be worth roughly $20,000 uh, if it's buildable. However, my acre has a large creek running through it with a ravine and a, 
it's not buildable. And so the value then is much lower. Um, that should be something that we catch in our uh, revaluation mass appraisal process, but 80,000 parcels, there's always things that we can miss. So vacant land, absolutely pictures if there are certain defects with the property. But uh, as Tara recommended, going through our GIS site, for example, uh, which is right here, you can look at your area, your district, you know, be it a township, be it a uh, village or a city, and you can look at the, um, you know, the average per acre values in your area uh, of vacant land and try to compare them and try to share um, you know, why perhaps yours is higher than many of your, your surrounding uh, uh, parcels. And that could be a great reasoning for a, a change of value. Mm -hmm. So we'll go down here to some frequently asked questions. So go ahead, Taryn, hit the number one. Yeah, so if I get a reduction in value, how do I get a refund or credit? So we kind of talked about this earlier, um, but we, we do hold any decisions made by the board, we hold for a 30 day pending appeal. Um, we don't go in, you know, if we're making an adjustment that isn't, especially isn't it what you requested, and there's a potential for you to appeal that decision to a higher court, we hold those for 30 days because we don't want to implement that value if you're going to appeal it. Um, so keep in mind, um, there's always going to be that 30 day hold for an appeal. But after that 30 days is expired, we can implement your new value in the system, go and adjust the taxes and either, you know, issue you some type of credit, whether you see it on your second half bill or as a refund. Part of that goes into the timing of when your adjustment is made. Um, like if we can do the adjustment by May or June, you'll see that on your second half bill. Bill. Um, but if we don't get, you know, to the to it until after July, you'll see it as a refund if it's an excess. And this is a perfect reminder that you're not appealing your actual tax amount. Uh, many folks to the revaluation had large changes in taxes, but their values they actually would agree with uh, the change in value, what what their new value is as of January 1st, 2020, especially considering the really strong real estate market that we've been seeing here in the county. So you're appealing the value of your property, what it would sell for you believe on January 1st of 2020, not necessarily what your actual tax amount or, or an increase in what your taxes uh, might be. So how about this next one? Uh, how long does an actual border revision uh, decision hold? So a border revision, the border revision only can hear complaints based on the current tax year. So, you know, you're, you're guaranteed the current tax year in which you file to get that, you know, value change. Typically, that value, the auditor will carry forward to hold within the three-year period. So, say you file this tax year for 2020, the beginning of a three-year period, um, your value change will more than likely hold for tax year 2020, 2021, and 2022. That's, you know, typically what happens. Now, there are some circumstances, um, say, you know, you, you purchase the property to flip it, and we know you're going to be doing some remodeling. Well, we'll probably make the adjustment for the current year, but make a note to recheck, you know, and see what type of, um, you know, improvements you've made since last year. So we, you know, we will keep an eye on it and check it a couple years. Um, but mo more than likely, you will see a change for a three-year period. I have had that question a lot because I've had some folks that filed last year, and they're like, you know, why did that not hold why do I you know have to file again when I just filed last year and that's just because of the timing of that you know three-year increments of when you're eligible to file and our countywide reevaluation starting that cycle over um, you know so in some cases depending on the timing you know you'll get a one year to three year change and that um, you know begs another kind of question too in terms of rechecking uh, many people will ask, well, can one of your appraisers come out and look at my house? Um, I have no problem showing you the inside, showing you some of the issues. Uh, sometimes border revision hearings will decide that uh, an in-person check is necessary or will ask for an in-person check. Uh, many residents have no issues with uh, our folks coming out, taking a look at the property. As I shared, you know, the more details uh, that we can have and, and uh, more uh, examples of your property condition, the better. So, uh, you know, that might include having us come out if you'd like, and we'll be more than happy to do so. So what, um, 
well, how about uh, this? It doesn't happen so much on the residential side sometimes, but it does happen quite a bit in the commercial side. Yeah, so um, part of why on the form under the columns A, B, and C, column C, it asks for the difference in value. And why that is on there is because anyone seeking a value change greater than $50,000 market value or $17,500 assessed, um, we have to notify the school district in that area. Um, the school board has 30 days then to file a counter complaint to be a party to your case. As David mentioned, you know, that's typically just larger commercial cases. We have seen it, you know, rarely on the residential side if it's a very significant decrease that, you know, someone is requesting. But yeah, the school can um, be made party to the case. So if the school files a counter complaint on your original filing, I will notify you, you know, I'll send out a letter letting you know that the school board decided, you know, to be a part of your case. And then at any hearing, you would want to keep in mind, you know, the school board would be there with their representation but they do have the right for 30 days to file to be a part of your complaint. If you've only, you know, asked for a $45,000 value difference, you know, you don't have to worry about it. the school board won't be notified. Quickly, $50,000 um, or greater change. So that may also cause a delay uh, occasionally uh, because of some of those time requirements and why some, some cases are pushed back. And uh, the last frequent asked question that we'll hit on, and, and just a reminder, if you have other questions, feel free to chat those in. We've been answering some as we go along here. Uh, how far back can a board revision uh, decision go? So the board can only deal with the current tax year, so January 1st of the filing year. Um, we cannot make any adjustments to prior years. So unfortunately, you know, if you you know, meant to file last year and you just got to filing this year and want the change to go back, you know, we unfortunately do not have the ability to do that. So we can only hear the current tax year that you're paying taxes on now. There are cases where, for example, um, you had uh, demolished a garage uh, and we had uh, missed that, for example, or other situations like that where um, we can you know, do a little bit more with you, but that's more outside of the board revision realm in terms of that one year. Um, but that's something definitely, if, if we have made an error, um, it's something to let us know for sure so that we can correct that, especially moving forward, but uh, in many cases also moving back too. And so those were all the, uh, the frequent asked questions, some of the, the different background, the process, the procedure for the board revision. Um, we have quite a lot of information here on our website. Again, I'll bring you to our homepage um, where we have uh, uh, we do have a new dog license registrar in Windsor if you live in Windsor um, but uh, actually this page here the questions on your tax charge uh, for property value uh, so much information here for you to review to go over uh, to take a look at um, and especially with your own property information too this will help your border revision um, hearing in case be able to present some of the information from your property and from surrounding properties that you may want to compare as well. Um, Tara, I'll uh, go to our contact page here. So how, how best uh, for your folks, if they've got more questions, can they come in person, can they email, call, can they fax, what, what would you recommend? Yeah, so, um, you know, any of those options work. Uh, you can always give me a call. Um, my direct phone number is 576-1484 um, or my email is always a good way to contact me as well. Um, my email is T-R-F-R-A-B-L-E, so T-R-F-R-A-B-L-E at ashtabulacounty.us. Um, and then our office, you know, we're open 8 to 4.30 every day, so you can always feel free to stop in. You know, I've talked to some people that had some trouble with the form and just felt more comfortable coming in, so you're more than welcome, you know, to stop in, and I can help with that. Yeah, wonderful. Well, we really appreciate everyone uh, tuning in, listening. Uh, this will be posted on our website and on YouTube as well for folks to take a look and to watch later on if you want to review or something that we had gone over. Definitely never hesitate to reach out, to call, to come in in person and talk to us. Um, that's what we're here for. We're here to help, and uh, we're always happy to do so. Um, so with that, thank you again so much. Thank you, Tara, for, for helping and for sharing out some information, and uh, hope you all have a wonderful evening. All right. Thanks.